Welcome to another episode of Peterson Deep Dives. The 1929 Ruxton was the combined passion of Archie Mouton Andrews, a flamboyant pitchman and stock manipulator, and William J. Muller, a racing enthusiast and engineer. It was sleek and sexy for its day, and so low slung that at a time when most American cars were too tall to see over, two people of average size could easily carry on a conversation standing on either side of it. And there was a good reason why. It was based on a concept that dated back to the 1769 Cuno from France and the very beginning of motorized transportation, front wheel drive. The idea of steering an automobile using the same physical system that was used to propel it is as old as the horse and carriage. And for millennia, it was natural for a carriage driver to sit high in the front, tugging the reins, while the actual horses did the work of both moving the carriage and establishing its direction. But when a mechanical source of power replaced horses, the engineering required for the drive wheels to both move and steer a vehicle reliably did not yet exist. And beginning with the first purpose-built passenger automobile, built by Benz in 1886, the rear wheels did the work of propelling the car, while the front did the work of steering it. By putting the horse before the cart in such a way was considered by many to be less than adequate compromise, and countless engineers attempted to correct what they perceived to be a problem. One of the first American engineers to tackle the problem was John Walter Christie, who built about seven front wheel drive cars of heroic proportions before 1910 most of which were used for exhibition racing at fairgrounds nationwide, although at least one was configured as a passenger car. Later efforts to market a viable front-wheel drive car included the 1917 Frontmobile from New Jersey and the 1918 Homer Laughlin from Los Angeles, which was built by the same company that still makes ceramic dishes and pottery. Called the Gila Monster, DeWitt's racer inspired Muller to pursue front-wheel drive technology and served as the inspiration for a road-going vehicle that would use it. But Muller's determination was halted with the onset of the First World War. Following the war to end all wars, Muller became a chief road test engineer for the Willys Company before joining the Edward G. Budd Manufacturing Company of Philadelphia, a builder of rail cars and automobile bodies in 1920. After firmly establishing his reputation as a gifted engineer, Muller received approval from Edward Budd to build a prototype car that would embody many of the ideas that he believed should be included. Within two years, on a reported budget of $35,000, Muller had built a large and luxurious sedan with a front-mounted Studebaker six-cylinder engine mated to a Warner four-speed transmission that delivered power to the front wheels. Because of its unique front-wheel drive configuration, Muller's prototype vehicle sat lower than most other cars of its time since it did not require that the floor of the passenger compartment be high enough to allow for clearance of a drive shaft to run beneath it. By lowering the center of gravity in such an ingenious way, the car offered greater stability at speed and better traction on inclines. The coachwork for the prototype was styled internally by Bud, and the finished vehicle had an overall height that was almost an entire foot lower than its contemporaries. Bud wanted to sell the concept to another company who would then contract them to provide the coachwork. When the prototype vehicle was brought to New York in 1929, it generated much curiosity, but the greatest interest would come from within the company's own ranks. After viewing Moeller's prototype automobile at the Bud plant, Archie M. Andrews, a member of Bud's board of directors, became fascinated by the vehicle. Andrews quickly approached the Hupp Motor Car Company, of which he was also a board member, about building a revolutionary new car. But when negotiations failed, he decided to produce it himself. According to some accounts, while Edward Budd was out of town early in 1929, Andrews directed Muller to secretly drive his prototype new to New York and stash it at the Yale Yacht Club while he went about forming a new company called New Era Motors to build it. Andrews then appointed Muller vice president of the new company and charged him with the responsibility of engineering a production version of the car while he was away seeking financial backing. Believing it would help him secure financing, Andrews named the car the Ruxton after William V.C. Ruxton, a prominent New York stockbroker from whom he hoped to secure the required capital. 
And even though the capital never materialized, the name stuck. Within a few months of founding New Era Motors, William J. Muller had engineered a viable production version that was ready to manufacture. Engineering differences from the prototype included the adoption of an eight-cylinder engine and a new transmission that allowed the entire drivetrain to be placed farther forward on the chassis for better weight distribution. Cosmetic changes involved the adoption of side-mounted spare tires and special wood light headlights. The most noticeable difference of all was the complete elimination of running boards. The vehicle was so low that it simply did not need them. New Era announced the Ruxton in spring 1929, and the car made headlines as the first American front-wheel drive passenger car. Cord's announcement of the front-wheel drive L29 soon followed, but while Cord controlled its own manufacturing and dealer network, Moeller and Andrews were still searching for a company interested in producing the Ruxton. Gardner, Marmon, Jordan, Stutz, and Pierce all declined, but the independent Moon Motor Car Company of St. Louis believed that an innovative new vehicle was exactly what it needed to replace their unprofitable Windsor. To gain complete control over his endeavor, Andrew soon seized control of the company from its founder and installed eight new directors to its board. But even though production had finally begun, it quickly became evident that Moon's aging facilities would be inadequate to achieve the production numbers Andrew was hoping for. His solution was to have the better equipped Kissel Motor Company, which was already producing the elaborate Ruxton transmission and differential, expand their facilities to produce complete Ruxton automobiles. By September of the same year, Ruxton was being produced at both the Moon plant in St. Louis and the Kissel plant in Hartford, Wisconsin. In order to make the Ruxton stand out among its competition, Andrews had recruited Broadway set designer and architect Joseph Urban to create eye-catching paint schemes for several show cars. Using horizontal bands, each in gradations of different colors, Urban was able to emphasize the Ruxton sedan's length and lowness, both of which would be major selling points. Those who responded favorably to the marketing efforts praised it for its roadability and comfort, often above its arch rival, Cord. But timing was not on Andrew's side, and the Ruxton hit the market mere months after the Stark market crash. Yet despite the superior engineering and style of the Ruxton, there were very few people with $3,200 available, the equivalent of approximately $50,000 today, to spend on a car, and the company could not stave off financial effects of the worsening economy. And in November 1930, after building only 20 vehicles, Kissel entered receivership and Moon declared bankruptcy. With no production facilities left, New Era followed suit only five days after, leaving an estimated 300 to 500 vehicles behind to mark its existence. And of a mere 19 surviving cars, the Peterson Automotive Museum's Model C is one of only four Roadster models known to exist. <laughs>